Welcome to the African Campfire Stories podcast. This podcast is dedicated to covering African history stories and events. To create this podcast, we have to read through a lot of facts and details. Should you pick up anything we get wrong, or should something we say offend you, or if you just want to reach us, please use our social media pages and our website. Search for African Campfire Stories on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Our website is www.africancampfirestories.com. Podcast episodes and articles on African history are available on the website. This podcast is now also available on YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Player FM, and SoundCloud. Just go to any of these platforms and search for African Campfire Stories Podcast. When creating our podcast episodes, we use works from historians and other writers as our sources. Much thanks to these men and women. Please note that today's episode is the second of a few episodes we are doing as a mini-series, specifically for the festive season. We are calling this collection of episodes the Christmas and Hanukkah special. We will also show in this mini-series how Africa, mostly in the form of Egypt, played a role in the politics, diplomacy and military affairs of the region that is called Canaan at a time when in that region Judaism and later on Christianity were being created. Africa also plays a part in the creation of early Christianity itself, as many of the founding Christian fathers were based in Egypt and other parts of North Africa. Later episodes will show this. A handful of early church popes were from Africa. We also get into the story of Ethiopian Christianity. Though much of southern Africa received Christianity from Europeans during the colonial era, which began around the 15th century AD to the 19th century AD, North African countries, Ethiopia and others, adopted Christianity before the European colonial era. Without much further ado, let us get into today's episode. This is the Christmas and Hanukkah special episode 2, Hanukkah and Judaism. Forgive us for opening this episode with a long quote, and please know that we would not present this entire quote were it not deemed by us to be very necessary in the understanding of the story we are telling. The following quote is from the First Testament of the Bible, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 7, verses 1 to 6. Open quote. When the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go to possess and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God delivers them over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show mercy to them, nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to their son, nor take their daughter for your son, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. So the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. But thus, You shall deal with them, you shall destroy their altars, and break down their sacred pillars, and cut down their wooden images, and burn their carved images with fire. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples of the face of the earth. Close quote. Here is another shorter quote. It's from the book of Joshua, chapter 6, verses 20 and 21. Please note that the term people in this quote is referring to Israelites and city refers to Jericho. Open quote. So, the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with great joy that the wall fell flat. Then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey, with the edge of the sword. Close quote. And the last quote in this vein is from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 20, verse 4. Open quote. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Close quote. You may have already noticed what these verses have in common. In case you haven't picked this up yet, these verses are from the First Testament of the Bible, a.k.a. the Tanakh, a book that is revered in Judaism, and also in Christianity too, by the way. These verses also further solidify the case we made in the previous episode that the founding concept of Judaism is land, God, and people. Just to situate the narrative and to keep proper track of our story, 
Let us do a quick summary of episode one of the Christmas and Hanukkah special. In episode one, which is the introductory episode of this mini-series, we mentioned a few concepts. We introduced the geographical area that we will be covering. We stated that we would provide maps of the area. Some of these areas mentioned in the long quote at the beginning of this episode can be seen on the maps. We stated that even some of the names of that area are controversial. We introduced some points about Judaism. We explained that Canaan has historically been a chaotic place. What we also did in episode one of this mini-series was to explain why we're doing this mini-series. We explained that we feel it makes sense to begin with the story of Judaism if one intends to eventually discuss the religions that are currently the biggest in Africa, Islam and Christianity. In episode one, we spent a lot of time explaining that this topic is very sensitive because it covers religion and thus, we will be as careful as possible in dealing with it. Take the case of the area or the territory on which this story occurs. In episode one, we gave various names for this place. For instance, Palestine, Israel, the Holy Land, etc. We did say these names are controversial and are liable to offend at least one group of people. We have looked further into this matter of the name and we have decided to use the name Canaan for this mini-series as we feel that this is the least offensive of the names. If that name and other things in this story offend you, please note that this is not our intention. Please let us know should anything offend you via our social media platforms and our website, the details of which are provided in the introduction of this episode. Let us continue with today's story. Before we read the long Bible verses above, we stated that we were going to do so because those quotes are important to the understanding of the story. For those listeners who know the First Testament, who will be aware that the verses that we have quoted are just a small drop in the big ocean of such verses. The verses are in essence telling the Jewish people that God is with them and that they can kill, destroy and devastate other Canaanites and whomever else for that matter. In order to secure the territory of Canaan, these kinds of verses from the Bible also usually imply that the destruction and devastation and the killing is necessary for the illustration of the glory of God. There are many such verses in the First Testament. For your own reading, check out these other First Testament books and verses. Exodus chapter 23 verses 22 to 24. Exodus chapter 23 verses 27 to 32. Exodus chapter 24 verses 11 to 12. Exodus chapter 34 verses 14 to 15. Deuteronomy chapter 9 verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 9 verses 3 to 5. Deuteronomy chapter 12 verses 2 to 4. Deuteronomy chapter 20 verses 16 to 18. Judges chapter 1 verse 27. And so on and so forth. This killing and fighting sanctioned by God of the Jews largely began after the Jews escaped from Egyptian slavery that we are told about in the book of Exodus. It's not clear whether the Jewish people were aware that this God-sanctioned fighting was going to be a phenomenon that would last centuries and would still be occurring even today. The Jews of that time must have thought that they would leave Egypt, kill lots of people in Canaan to create space for themselves, and then they would sit back and enjoy the fruits of the land that their prophet said was promised to them. However, as we know, it wasn't going to be that way. The Jews would fight again and again. In the story of the Bible that deals with God promising Canaan to the Jewish people, there is hardly any hint that the reality of Canaan would be constant fighting and constant struggle. However, it is hard to imagine Judaism without this constant fighting and struggle. The 2,000 or so years from when the patriarch Abraham was asked by God to go to Canaan to the time when Christianity was being founded are filled with the kind of strife and suffering that make it impossible for Judaism to have come out differently than how it eventually did. We will talk about the patriarch Abraham later in this episode. The story of the first Jewish-Roman war, which was partially covered towards the end of the previous episode, is about the Jews fighting with the Romans over Canaan. Another example of this constant fighting over Canaan comes from the story of Hanukkah itself. The story of Hanukkah is about the Jews fighting with the Greeks for Canaan. This story and how the Jewish people have raised it to a religious celebration tells you almost everything you need to understand about the fundamental ideas that underpin Judaism. Think about this fact for a moment. How many Christian holidays or celebrations are based on Christians fighting back against an enemy? Then count 
the number of celebrated Jewish heroes who are celebrated because they were about the fighting and the struggle. Samson, King David, Joshua, the prophet Moses, and then you have the Maccabees, the family that is behind the story of Hanukkah. We will now look at the Hanukkah story before we proceed with the rest of our bigger story on Judaism. The events that led to the Hanukkah story occurred in 164 BCE. But to make sense of what was going on in Canaan at the time, we have to begin at about 170 BCE, six years before the story of Hanukkah occurred. As you listen to the Hanukkah story, think about the basic salient points that we deduced in episode one about Judaism. We arrived on those salient points based on the history of Judaism. And in episode one, we tested those salient points based on the events that occurred in Jerusalem in 66 AD slash CE. Events which led to the beginning of the first Jewish-Roman war. Now, we will test those same salient points against the events of the Hanukkah story. So, what salient points are we talking about? Firstly, we said that in the history of Judaism, there is always a very powerful external enemy who is threatening the Jews with extinction and threatening to take the land on which the Jews reside. Secondly, we said there is always some very serious internal Jewish bickering. This bickering allows for outsiders or the external enemy to come in, which means that some of the outsiders are brought in by some of the Jews themselves. This now only leaves out only two salient points. That is, the issue of the temple and temple priests. And the last point is the fact that ancient Jews were tenacious fighters. Now, let's see if you can pick up these four salient points from the story. Remember the points are 1. Very powerful external enemy. 2. Internal Jewish bickering. 3. Temple and temple priests. And 4. Ancient Jews were tough fighters. Just as we did in episode 1 with the events of 66 AD, we will again use historian Simon Seabag Montefiore to explain the events of Hanukkah. Again, the quote is slightly adjusted to simplify certain things, but the spirit of the quote remains unchanged. Open quote. Jews, from Babylon to Alexandria in Egypt, now paid an annual tithe to the temple, and Jerusalem was so rich that her treasures intensified power struggles amongst the Jewish leaders and started to attract the cash-strapped Greek kings. Close quote. At this time, Canaan was occupied by the Greeks, actually by Macedonians, to be precise. This was because these Macedonians were the successors of Alexander the Great. The latter had conquered Canaan in 332 BCE, so about 160 years before the story of Hanukkah took place. Canaan was at this time under a Greek Macedonian king called Antiochus IV. Antiochus's family is known historically as the Seleucids or the Seleucid dynasty. They take this name from the founder of the dynasty, Seleucus. Seleucus had been a general under Alexander the Great. Back to Mr. Montefiore and his quote, open quote. Antiochus called himself Epiphanes, meaning the God Manifest, though his subjects named him Epumanes, meaning the madman. He hoped to bind his kingdom, including Canaan, together around the worship of one king, one religion. He wanted his subjects to worship their local gods and merge them into the Greek gods and the worship of his own cult. But the Jews had a love-hate relationship with Greek culture. They craved its civilization, but hated and resented its dominance. Some Jews in Jerusalem were adopting Greek culture, fashions and the use of Greek names, but not the traditionalist Jews. To these Jews, the Greeks were simply worshippers of idols. After Antioch became king, the Jewish leaders raced each other to him so he could grant them power and influence. The high priest, Onias III, made his bid to the king. In this case, bid means bribe. However, Onias' brother Jason paid more money and was thus made the new high priest by the Greek king. Close quote. The external party in this quote are the Greeks. 
The internal Jewish bickering and vying for power is also evident on the quote. This bickering, by the way, gets even more brazen and extreme than even the quote shows. The temple politics have been established with the above quote. We have seen how the Jewish leaders are bribing the Greek king for a very important title of temple high priest, but worst was to come. King Antiochus then went ahead and aggravated the Jews. In 170 BC, Antiochus conquered Egypt. Note that by 170 BC, Egypt hadn't been ruled by native Egyptians for centuries and would never again be ruled by her natives in any significant way. At that time, Egypt, like Canaan, was also under the rule of the Greeks, Macedonians. But these were not the same Greeks as the ones that were ruling over Canaan. But the Greeks ruling Egypt were also successors of Alexander the Great. Alexander had conquered Egypt the same year he conquered Canaan, that is 332 BCE. Hey, this guy isn't called the Great for nothing. He was a busy man. The interesting thing for African history is that the Greek rulers of Egypt during that time and afterwards were known as the Ptolemaic dynasty. After Antiochus conquered Egypt in 170 BC, Egypt would go back to being ruled by the Ptolemaic Greek rulers. The Greek dynasty ruling Egypt was named after another one of Alexandra's generals, this one guy called Ptolemy. This Ptolemy is the great, 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 great granddaddy of the famous Egyptian queen Cleopatra VII. You probably know her better as just Cleopatra. Yes, Cleopatra was Greek. Her name comes from the Greek words Cleos and Pater. Cleos means glory and Pater means father. So please remember to keep these Greek dynasties straight. Antiochus was a Seleucid. The Seleucid controlled mainly Syria and Canaan. The Greeks in Egypt were the Ptolemies. But I digress, now back to our story. As King Antiochus was away, conquering Egypt, the Jews rebelled. This obviously pissed Antiochus off. Here is a list of the things he did to get back to the Jews. He deported 10,000 Jews. He entered the Holy of Holies, the holiest place in the Temple of Jerusalem, and stole religious artifacts, including the golden altar and the candlestick of light. He ordered the Jews to sacrifice animals to him as God manifest. He then took a break from messing with the Jews and went back to Egypt to crush the Egyptians even further. He also dealt a bit with the ambassadors of the Roman Empire, who were bullying Antiochus. In essence, at this point, the Romans didn't care about Canaan-related issues. They wanted Antiochus to evacuate from Egypt. You might ask yourself, why on earth were the Romans, whose capital was back in Italy, bullying a Greek king based in the eastern Mediterranean? And why were the Romans protecting Egypt? After listening to this episode, check out episode 3 of our Xenophobia and Hatred series. The episode is called Rome and Carthage. Rome had defeated Carthage in the First and Second Punic Wars. And with Carthage now out of the way, Rome was at this time beginning the process of taking over the entire Mediterranean Sea region, including North Africa, where Egypt is based. Plus, at this time, Egypt was solidifying the role it would play for the entirety of the Roman Empire. And that role was that of food provider. So the Roman concerns with Egypt had to do with looking after their food source. By this time, the Ptolemaic Greek dynasty ruling in Egypt was so weak that it needed Rome to protect it from the Seleucid Greek dynasty. This weakness explains why over a century later, Rome would eventually be able to easily snatch Egypt from Queen Cleopatra. Here's an example of Rome's bullying Antiochus. When Antiochus told the Roman ambassador that he would need some time to think about leaving Egypt alone, the Roman ambassador took a stick and drew a line on the ground that formed a circle around where Antiochus was standing. And the ambassador told Antiochus that he'd better make up his mind before he left that small circle. Ancient politics and diplomacy are so interesting. Imagine if this kind of thing were to happen today. The ambassador of, say, the USA drawing a line around the president of a less powerful country. This drawing of that line basically meant that Antiochus had to make up his mind about evacuating Egypt on the spot. Eventually, he acknowledged that Rome was too powerful and complied. This event is said to be the origin of the phrase to draw a line in the sand. Because we are an African history podcast. It is fun for us to have Egypt pop up in this story. In case you've read ahead, you will know that the Romans would eventually kick out the Seleucid Greeks and rule over Canaan themselves. 
Remember from our 66 AD story in episode 1 that the Jews would be fighting the Romans for Canaan and not the Greeks by that time. Canaan, on which Jesus Christ would be born into just over a hundred years after this time, was ruled by the Romans and no longer by the Greeks. As Antiochus was being bullied by the Romans, he heard that the Jews were refusing to sacrifice to him. After being bullied just recently, <laughs> this latest infringement by his Jewish subjects must have been extra annoying to Antiochus and pissed him off it did. In greater anger, Antiochus was now determined to extinguish the Jewish religion completely. Here are some of the things he did in order to achieve his new goal. In 167 BCE, Antiochus captured Jerusalem on a Sabbath, which meant that he would find the Jews flat-footed, as the Sabbath day is a day on which Jews do little activity and thus they would have been not as careful as they would have been on any other day. He murdered thousands of people in Jerusalem and destroyed the city walls so that Jerusalem would not be easy to defend in the future. He handed the city over to a Greek governor and also to his Jewish stooge, a man named Menelaus. Oh, this point. Remember, we have stated that in all such tragic Jewish stories, the theme of internal Jewish bickering, which leads to selling out, is ever present. He forbade any sacrifices and any services in the temple. The temple was the center of Jewish life. It did not only exist for religious purposes, it was also a center for business. Over a century after this time, Jesus Christ would go into the temple and overturn the tables of the so-called money changers in the temple. These money changers were central to the Jewish economy. Many historians claim that this deed by Jesus is one of the main reasons that occasioned his arrest and his being put to the trial that led to his execution. The story of Jesus Christ and Christianity is coming later on in this mini-series though. Antiochus then banned the Sabbath and the Jewish law of circumcision with death as punishment for infringing these bans. He ordered the temple to be polluted with pig flesh. In Judaism, as in Islam, the pig is seen as the very representation of dirtiness and filth and unholiness. So, this action was meant to piss off the Jews big time. We will not recount all the things Antiochus tried to do in order to eradicate Judaism, but the above is enough to make you get the point of what he was attempting to do. One thing that we will mention is that Antiochus had the Jews who infringed his ban on observing the Sabbath burned alive and crucified. Some historians say that punishment by crucifixion was brought into Canaan by the Greeks. The Romans, who were never ashamed to steal what they thought were good ideas, would continue this practice. And over 100 years from this period, Jesus Christ would be executed in this manner by the Romans. The evil deeds of Antiochus are said by some Christians, historians, Christian scholars and some Jewish scholars to have been predicted many centuries earlier by the writer or writers of the First Testament book of Daniel. They also believe that the book of Daniel predicts the split of Alexander the Great's Greek Empire into the Seleucid and Ptolemaic Greek dynasties we have spoken about in this episode. The prediction about Seleucid and Ptolemaic kingdoms is said to be contained in Daniel chapter 11 verses 5 to 20. In these verses, there is mention of the kings of the north and south. This is believed to mean the Seleucid dynasty and the Ptolemaic dynasty respectively. The other prediction about Antiochus's evil deeds is said to be contained in Daniel chapter 11 verses 21 to 35. As a fair and objective history podcast, we are obligated to inform you that there are however some scholars and historians that dispute the fact that the book of Daniel predicted these events. Arguments about this range from scholars who think that the things that the book of Daniel talks about have nothing to do with the events above. To scholars who state that the events of the book of Daniel were written after the events occurred, which thus means that the authors of the book were retrofitting history and presenting events that had already occurred as a prophecy. We've told you the stories above. You can thus read these verses and decide for yourself if the verses are a prophecy. If you are not a Christian or if you do not have a Bible, there are many Bible websites that can help you to access these verses. We would recommend the Bible Gateway website, which we ourselves are using a lot in researching and writing this mini-series. There is also the Bible Hub websites and many others. Bible scholarship is a very broad field. And if you are interested in learning more about what Bible scholars have been arguing about these past 100 years, you can check out podcasts like The History in the Bible Podcast and The History of the Papacy Podcast. 
and Bible historians like Bart D. Ehrman. Later on in this mini-series, we will talk about Jesus Christ and his role of the Messiah and the authorship of the New Testament. You will get to understand why we are bringing up issues of prophecy and Bible scholarship. The Jews were angered and mortified by all these punitive actions from Antiochus. Enter Judas Maccabee. No relation to the new, no relation to the more famous Judas, who is said to have sold out Jesus Christ over a century later. Judas is the man who made the story of Hanukkah possible. From 167 BC to 137 BC, the Maccabee family would instigate and lead what is known to history as the Maccabean Revolt. This period would see an era of Jewish independence and the Jewish rule over the area of Canaan that at the time was known as Judea. Sorry for the slew of dates and names that we are about to inflict on you. We just need to do a quick summary review of how the Jewish kingdoms lost their independence in the first place and why the ascent of the Maccabee family during the Maccabean revolt was such a big deal and why in turn Hanukkah is such a significant event in the history of Judaism. Here goes. After the legendary King Solomon, the builder of the original temple in Jerusalem, died in 932 BCE, his Jewish kingdom was split into two kingdoms by the competing power centers amongst the Jews themselves. Remember our point about the incessant internal Jewish bickering. In the north was born the kingdom of Israel, and the kingdom in the south was called Judah. The northern kingdom was conquered by the Assyrian Empire in 722 BCE. In 609 BCE, the kingdom of Judah was acquired by Egypt and turned into an Egyptian vassal state. Four years later, in 605 BCE, Babylonia, under the famous king Nebuchadnezzar, defeated Egypt, which was under the rule of a pharaoh named Necho. This then allowed Babylonia to take over the control of the Jewish kingdoms in Canaan and to take over Egypt too. After this, there were some bouts or little periods of time where the Jews would rebel and reacquire their independence. But these were of insignificant duration, so we won't overload you with the names and dates about them. The main Jewish rebellion we feel is worth mentioning is a rebellion led by Zedekiah in 587 or 586 BCE against Babylonia. This rebellion resulted in the famous destruction of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem and in the even more famous exile or deportation of the Jews to Babylon. The Babylonians were defeated by the Persians under Cyrus the Great in 539 or 538 BCE. This led to the freeing of the Jews and they were given permission to settle back in Canaan. The Persians started the process of rebuilding the temple that had been destroyed by the Babylonians. In 332 BCE, the Persians would be removed from Canaan and Egypt by the Greeks, led by Alexander the Great, as we have seen already in this episode. In 323 BCE, Alexander would die and the splitting up of his empire followed. This led to the rule of Canaan by the Greek Seleucids and Egypt by the Greek Ptolemies. The kings of the north and the kings of the south, according to the scholars who believe that the book of Daniel predicted these events. As we have already seen, the Maccabean revolt would begin in 167 BCE. This revolt was against the Seleucid dynasty under King Antiochus, whom we are already familiar with in this episode. In 164 BCE, Judas Maccabee would lead the Jewish conquest of Jerusalem and the area of Canaan that was known as Judea. The name Maccabee means the hammer. It was a nickname given to his family. The real historical name of the family is the Hasmonean dynasty. After Judas took control of Jerusalem and the temple, the story of Hanukkah would be set in motion. The altar of the temple was rebuilt and the temple sacrifices resumed on the 25th of the Jewish month of Chislev, that is November or December in the Gregorian calendar. We will explain this shortly. This event is celebrated as the eight-day feast of Hanukkah, the dedication, the dedication. There is a sub-story that accompanies the main story of the dedication. Apparently, as Jerusalem was in a state of devastation, 
from the fighting that had taken place as part of the Maccabean takeover of the city. There was a shortage of oil to light the candelabra in the temple, but somehow the candles never went out. This sub-story has become one of the key points celebrated during Hanukkah. Just as a side note, it's an interesting exercise for us to wonder why Judas Maccabee, or at least one of the members of the Maccabean family, was not named the Messiah by the Jews or the Jewish scholars. We're saying this because of the Jewish expectation of what the Messiah would be, in essence. The Messiah, according to Jewish requirements, would be a powerful king or a powerful commander of armies who would drive out the enemies of the Jewish people and restore their rule over Canaan. Judas and his family certainly did achieve that, but Maybe the Maccabean lack of connection to the house of King David is why they could not be considered the Messiah. Could it be? This stipulation or requirement, the connection of the Messiah to King David, is a reason given by some historians as to why the writers of the Second Testament of the Bible saw it necessary to state that Jesus Christ descended from the house of David. If anyone has a theory or explanation as to why the Maccabees were not considered a Messiah, please let us know. Looking at the importance of the Maccabean family in Jewish history and the fact that Hanukkah exists only because of the events occasioned by the Maccabees, the other interesting side note is why the two books of the Maccabees did not make the Hebrew Bible. Of course, there is the very arcane and academic explanation that the books are part of what is known in biblical scholarship as the Apocrypha. The word Apocrypha derives from ancient Greek and it is roughly translated to mean hidden. Books that are part of the Apocrypha are said to have been written between 400 BCE and 200 BCE. What is even more interesting is that the text from the books of Maccabee appear in some versions of the Bible as some Christian churches. Christian churches like the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. This is interesting because the Maccabees are heroes to the Jews. Because of that, you would think that the Hebrew Bible would be the one to include the books of the Maccabees, not the Christian Bible. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church includes three books that are called Maccabean, or the Ethiopian Maccabees, in its Old Testament. But these books are not at all the same as the books of Maccabees that appear in the Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox Bible. The books of the Ethiopian Maccabees do not tell the story of the Maccabean family at all. The family behind Hanukkah. It is a completely different Maccabee. We will talk about Ethiopian Christianity when we get to the part of this mini-series that covers Christianity and its spread in Africa. Anuga, in case you are not aware, is a very important holy period in Judaism. In 2019, Anuga was between 22 December and 30 December. But the exact dates change every year. This is because Hanukkah always begins on the 25th day of Kislev, which is the ninth month in the Jewish calendar. The Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar, which means it's based upon the cycles of the moon. The modern secular calendar, meaning a non-religious calendar, used by most people around the world and called the Gregorian calendar, is a solar calendar. This means that it's based upon the Earth's revolution around the sun. Hanukkah is always on the 25th day of Kislev, in the Jewish calendar. But on the secular Gregorian calendar, that date can fall anywhere between November or late November and late December. Now that Hanukkah is out of the way, we will continue with our bigger story about the Judaism foundation. Judaism was one of the early religions that adopted the idea of one God, if not the earliest one to do so. The idea of one God was strange and revolutionary in the ancient world. Christianity and Islam, born out of Judaism, would also carry the idea of one God forward, to the extent that for much of the world today, the idea of one God is normal. Many scholars, Muslims and Jews, do not believe that Christianity is based on one God. Those people state that the idea of having Jesus Christ, who is a co-equal to God, means that the religion is not based on one God. Right now we won't go into such debates in detail. But when we get to discuss Christianity on this mini-series, we will explore these kind of things further. The following fact illustrates how strange the idea of one God was at the beginning. Historians and sociologists have done some number crunching and they state that in the first century AD, the time when Christianity was being founded, the people who believed in one God, i.e. Christians and Judaism practitioners, made up only 7% of the population of the Roman Empire. At the time, the Roman Empire stretched from modern-day Scotland in the west to modern-day Iraq in the east, and from the borders of Sahara Desert in the south to modern-day Germany in the north. The total population of the Roman Empire is estimated to have been at about 4 to 5 million people at this particular time. 93% of these people 
are said to have been members of religions that had many gods. So, why are we going on about the point of one god versus many gods? Well, this helps us to make sense of why the writers of the First Testament are so obsessed with informing the Israelites that they have to stick to one God of the Jews. The very first commandment of the Ten Commandments is about sticking to one God, and the second one is about respecting the one God. This stemmed from the fact that the Jews would backslide and try out the other gods that were available, which, by the way, was a legitimate concern because the Jews spend a lot of time in the First Testament backsliding. So, who is this one God? How come did the Jews get the idea of one God? And where does the idea that the one God wants the Jews to show fidelity towards him? When the prophet Moses asked God, what is thy name? The reply Moses received was, I am that I am. In the Hebrew language, this is rendered in the letters YHWH or Yahweh or Yahweh. This is the same God who would go on to be the God of Christianity. However, the early Christians misspelled the name and turned it to Jehovah. For the Jews, the letters YHWH or the name Yahweh is forbidden. Only the high priest of the temple could say that name. But even he could only say it once a year. Mostly, the Jews use the name Adonai when referring to God. Adonai means Lord, or they use Hashem, which means the unspeakable name. According to the First Testament, the book of Genesis, the founding father of the Jewish people is Abram. He was later renamed by God to Abraham, which means father of the people. Around 1943 BCE, Abraham left Ur in Mesopotamia, which is modern-day Iraq, and settled in Hebron which is located about 32 kilometers south of Jerusalem, which makes Hebron part of Canaan, of course. According to the book of Genesis, Abraham left Mesopotamia at the behest of God. God asked him to leave his home and to go to a land which God would show him. That land turned out to be Canaan. One can argue with good reason that it was exactly at this moment that the Jewish people's battle of Canaan began. Even though at the time it was not necessarily a battle with weapons, that struggle that began with Abraham's move into Canaan is still taking place 4,000 years later. Neither the Bible nor Jewish scholars argue against the fact that when Abraham moved into Canaan, there were people already staying there. Archaeology also proves that Canaan was occupied before the Jews moved in. So, this land that God was promising was not empty, it was occupied. It's this fact that has been at the heart of the Jewish fight for struggle for Canaan. It's the fact that there is not one time in Jewish history where Canaan was just only available to the Jews. There is always someone else. And most times, those other people are not too keen to give up what they also consider to be their land. Abraham left Mesopotamia in 1943 BC. And from that point on, he is regarded as to have been in the process of founding Judaism. This was almost 2,000 years before the founder of Christianity, Jesus Christ, would be born. In that 2,000-year gap, the Jewish people would define and redefine Judaism until people like John the Baptist and Jesus Christ would adopt Judaism and put it irrevocably on the path towards the Christianity we know today. After Jesus passed away, people like Apostle Paul, James the Just, and St. Peter would engage in the process of establishing the Christian church. God would go on and test Abraham by requesting him to kill his son Isaac on, an, on a mountain in the land of Moriah, which is said to be where Mount Moriah is, at the Temple Mount of Jerusalem. Abraham and his sons Isaac and Jacob are collectively known as the patriarchs. Jacob's role, in particular, is significant because his alias is Israel, which means one who wrestles with God. Jacob is thus said to be the ancestor of the Israelites. In the book of Genesis, in chapter 12, verses 2 to 13, it states that God promises to make Abraham a great nation. God also says that he would make Abraham's name great, that he would bless Abraham and curse those who curse Abraham. In verse 7, the following is stated, open quote, To your descendants I will give this land. Close quote. This is as far as we know, the first ever promise that God makes to the Jewish people. By the way, 
We stated in episode 1 that holy books such as the Bible are difficult to understand and can be interpreted in many different ways. For instance, if Muslims believe that Abraham is the founder of Islam as well, this means that they can also interpret the above quote to mean that Canaan was also given to them. However, we are not going to get into those kind of things in this mini-series. Things that we are all aware have now taken a political hue. This is also a good time to state that we are also not saying that we support the claims made by the Jews to Canaan or claims made by anyone else for that matter. This is partly why we have avoided calling Canaan the promised land. Also, some of the history buffs among you could be rattled by the fact that we are quoting the Bible so much in this history podcast. Some quotes of which, from the perspective of the academic field of history, might not meet the criteria of what is legitimately considered true or not true. For such problematic issues, please listen to episode 1 of this mini-series, if you have not done so. There, we stated that for this mini-series, we are not trying to conform nor to falsify any of the holy books we will be making mention of. Please note the following. To us, as far as this story goes, what is important about the quotes from the Bible or from any other holy books that we might talk about is the fact that the people in the story we are talking about believed these things to be true for their religion and for their community. You can prove all you want, whether the statements in the Bible where God is said to have promised Canaan to the Jews are historically accurate or not. The point is that this idea of Canaan being given to the Jews is something many Jews regard as the foundation of their religion and the subject of a fair amount of contestation. They therefore, since time immemorial, have acted and still act as if these things are facts. and. When any group of people on earth believe something and then act on it, figuring out whether that something is true or not becomes an irrelevant academic exercise. The fact of the matter is that once that belief is acted out, it becomes reality. And as human beings, we deal in the realm of reality. And not in terms of academic stringency and purity. Take this example as an illustration of reality versus academic posturing. If someone believes that the car you legally own was granted to him by a deity and comes to take it, you have to deal with that reality. Someone has taken your car. If, say, for instance, you have a strong academic argument that the deity does not even exist, what does that matter? In as far as the fact that the reality that he has taken your car and he won't give it back, we are not using the First Testament biblical quotes to prove nor to disprove anything. We are using those quotes to explain what the Jewish people believe to be their reality. The same way we will use the Christian Second Testament to show how Christians think about their beliefs and their reality. When the time to discuss Islam comes around, we will use the Quran to illustrate what Muslims believe. You can agree or disagree with what the holy book says. It is your right to do so. But to understand this story, you have to view some parts of it through the lens of these beliefs. We unfortunately have to end here today. Catch us on episode 3 of this mini-series as we continue to shed some light on the story of Judaism and Christianity. We will continue with the story of the descendants of Abraham and the struggle they faced in keeping the land that the God of the Jews had promised to Abraham. We have already discussed some instances of this struggle in episode 1 and on this episode. All that fighting with the Assyrians, Egyptians, Babylonians, Persians, the Greeks and the Romans was part of the struggle of retaining Canaan. The inheritance that Abraham left to his descendants was a dangerous one and one that required constant defense. Last point before we go. On the next episode, we will also explore further the promises that God made to the Jewish people and the covenant that existed between them and God. This covenant is the foundation of Judaism and it serves as a significant factor in shaping Christianity as well. See you next time.